if you followed my work for, for any length of time, you know that I kind of think in this process about the various different functional systems in the body. And, you know, every practitioner and every person that's teaching training programs and all that kind of thing have different ways of looking at the body. For instance, Dr. Dan Kalish, he doesn't look at the GI system first. He looks at the adrenals first. And so he would look at the very first thing that he would do is someone is run an adrenal stress index. Hence, I celebrate adrenal cortisol DHEA ratios. Then he would look uh, further downstream at the GI. I'm, a, I'm you know, an all-time naturopath, and I believe that uh, you know, everything starts with what we put in our bodies and how we handle that stuff that gets into our bodies is very, very important. So um, I look at the GI system, and I look at it from the digestive perspective. You know, as uh, Gray Graham of Biotics Research Northwest, who was one of my early mentors, would say, you know, digestion is a north to south process. Starts up in the mouth. In fact, some would even say digestion starts up in the head. When you're starting to think about food, we have a neuro uh, endocrine type of uh, reflex that causes salivation and our stomach juices to start uh, being secreted just by the thought of eating. We smell food. Um, then we put the food in our mouth. If we chew it properly, it starts in the mouth with various salivary amylases and breaking stuff down, and then it moves into the stomach where we get primary protein digestion. We have that acidic environment. Then it moves through into the small intestine where the acidity of the chyme triggers a reflex for dumping in of bicarbonate. And we get a release of all these different hormones that are triggering and starting the primary digestion of, of break, further breakdown of, of polypeptides into individual amino acids. We get the breakdown of carbohydrates and through amylases and that type of thing. So, you know, the whole upper GI, looking at the uh, stomach, somewhat the small intestine, and the role that the gallbladder plays is what we cover in these first two systems. So if I'm looking at a blood test and I want to evaluate whether or not these systems are out of function for a particular patient, these are the elements that I'm going to look at. In fact, the very first element that I look at on a blood chemistry screen is globulin. Is the globulin high or is the globulin low or is the globulin normal? If it's between 2.4 and 2.8 here in the U.S. or 24 and 28 for those of you with standard international units, that's optimal. That means that, you know, potentially the GI system, you know, is not super inflamed or not super dealing with hypergloid. It doesn't mean that there isn't hypergloid because there probably is because so many of our patients are suffering from this low functional stomach acid in our stomachs. So these are just basically, you know, when we're looking at uh, the GI function, there are, of course, different elements that we would add in here. You know, calcium, MCV, alkaline phosphatase could be used to sort of build up our picture of hypochlorhydria, but just sort of bare bones elements for looking at the GI system, these are the five or six that I would, I would focus on. Eosinophils are more about sort of intestinal parasites, um, globulins, phosphorus, BUN protein, and that type of thing. Then we have to move down through the digestive tract to the gallbladder. So the gallbladder is responsible, obviously, for secreting bile. Bile is involved in the um, uh, emulsification of fatty acids that come into our body. And so is the gallbladder working? So what are the elements that we would look at that would sort of begin to sort of trigger uh, a thinking process that maybe the gallbladder isn't working as well as it should? Well, first of all, we look at GGT, we look at total bilirubin. If we've got direct bilirubin, that's wonderful. We look at total cholesterol, we look at the alkaline phosphatase. Alkaline phosphatase is a great gallbladder mark. If you're looking at gallbladder disease, alkaline phosphatase is one of the first markers that will probably be elevated. We're looking at triglycerides. In fact, um, one of the conditions that I see that we're focusing on or we're seeing quite a lot of is low cholesterol. Now, obviously, we've got patients from statin medications, so that would lower the cholesterol anyway. But in a non-medicated patient, I'm actually seeing a lot more low cholesterol than I did 15 years ago. And Joseph McCullough of McCullough.com, in one of his lectures and one of his talks and, and articles that he wrote, he said, you know, the number one thing to think about when you see a low total cholesterol 
is gallbladder issues. Kind of interesting. So now we've dealt with digestion, we've dealt with the gallbladder. Now we start to look at how does our body deal with minerals and vitamins. See, if we jumped in and just looked at mineral balance and vitamin balance before we assessed whether or not the body can handle them, we would probably be putting these things into a body that hasn't had these systems evaluated and, and checked and treated. So you can give someone the best nutrients in the world, the cleanest, most pristine diet in the world, highly absorbable nutrients, but if their core digestive absorption utilization systems are out of whack, then this becomes sort of redundant on some level. So minerals, what minerals are we looking at? We're obviously looking at calcium, phosphorus, we're looking at zinc with alkaline phosphatase, we're looking at iron, uh, uric acid tells us about molybdenum, so those are just some of the minerals that we can take a look at. What about vitamins? Homocysteine tells us about B6 and B12 and folate to some degree. Anion gap tells us about thiamine. We're looking at vitamin D. And then the red blood cell indices can tell us about different types of anemia. B12 anemia, B6 anemia, vitamin C deficiency anemia. Uh, and so those are some of the vitamins that we could take a look at. Then we move into blood sugar regulation. We're looking at the blood sugar regulation through the lens of the pancreas. And so this is where those uh, interconnected blood sugar regulation elements that I was mentioning earlier come into play. So we're going to look at glucose, fasting glucose. We'll look at fasting insulin. We'll look at hemoglobin, A1C. We'll look at LDH. Low LDH, remember, is a marker for reactive hyperglycemia. So what we're really trying to evaluate here is where on the road to diabetes is my patient. Am I early on the road, that's the patient that comes in with reactive hyperglycemia and almost low blood sugar that may be triggered by, you know, a diet that has too many refined carbohydrates. So we get this spike of sugars. Insulin gets secreted, but too much insulin, and then that causes the glucose to drop, and they get really, you know, I don't know if any of you have experienced low blood sugar. It's not much fun. You get kind of spacey, and, and all you want to do is reach for something that's going to cause you to stop shaking and, and, and that sort of thing. You really want sugar at that point. But if you keep doing this, you have up and down, up and down. We have that reactive hyperglycemia. You're going to wear out your systems, and then you're going to look into the early stages of metabolic syndrome. The body's going to become in, resistant to insulin. Triglycerides are going to start to slowly creep up. Cholesterol is going to start to slowly creep up. Blood pressure will start to slowly creep up. Glucose, instead of being low, will now start to creep up being high. So looking at it through the optimal uh, ranges, we can really uh, make an impact here. Then we take a look at the neuroendocrine regulation. We look at the adrenals. Uh, we're looking here at the ratios between potassium, sodium, and DHEA. Then we have liver function. Uh, we've got a lot of enzymes and different systems of the body that we look at. We have AST and ALT and GGT. Uh, one of the things that I talk about in the training is depending on which one of these elevated, you can tell kind of which body system to look at. If GGT is elevated above these two, consider it's a gallbladder issue. ALT elevated above these two, consider that a, a pure liver condition. AST above ALT and GGT could be a liver, have a liver component to it but also, um, you know, it could be cardiovascular system, it could be the muscles and that type of thing. Alkaline phosphatase, uh, bilirubin, albumin, albumin, globulin ratio, all very important for working out your different liver issues. Are we looking at early stage liver dysfunction? The liver's just not really working well. It's becoming sluggish. You know, you always heard the term the sluggish liver and that type of thing. Well, uh, the blood chemistry analysis isn't necessarily that good at, at, at working in that realm, although I would say albumin is a good marker for that. It really comes into play when, you know, a liver dysfunction is allowed to go unchecked, and now we start to see some damage happening to the liver cells themselves. So these, a lot of these are enzymes that are inside the intracellular. We should only see a small amount of these in the body, and when we start to see them rising above the optimal range, but before the pathological normal range, we know that something's not right. And that's kind of the time to, to, to begin our work. Don't wait until it's above the reference range in order to start in, implementing, you know, liver repairing and liver soothing, liver helping protocols. 
Let me look at kidney and genital urinary system. These are oftentimes the organ systems that bear the brunt of a liver that's not working properly. The kidney is, uh, has so many different functions in the body, and so we can look at uh, BUN and creatinine, alkaline phosphatase, PSA to a certain extent with the genital urinary system. In the males, uh, if I see a creatinine above 1.1, my little light bulb goes off, there might be something happening here with the prostate, benign prostatic hypertrophy, that type of thing. Uh, also, we have the EGFR, estimated glomerular filtration rate. Again, using BUN creatinine, it's a calculated measurement based upon age and race and gender, and it will then estimate uh, how well the glomerulus is working as a filter. So we're penetrating deeper into the body systems. Now we have the neuroendocrine regulation of the thyroid, and this is obvious here. We've got our main thyroid issues. So with these, we're looking at uh, three uh, types of hypothyroidism, actually four. The main one is primary hypothyroidism. This is a problem with the thyroid gland itself, and typically the TSH will be elevated with that, and you will typically see low uh, thyroxin and T3. Then we have secondary hypothyroidism, and that's usually a pituitary issue. And with that, you're going to see an increase, sorry, a decreased TSH. So it might look like hyperthyroidism, but the patient's going to be complaining of hypothyroid symptoms. Then we have a tertiary uh, issue, which is um, up at the level of the hypothalamus. And this can be sort of an oxidative stress or a mitochondrial issue causing the hypothalamic function to not work quite as well. Seeing this a little more nowadays than I ever used to, uh, because I think we're seeing a lot of brain issues in our, in our patients, and that has an effect on the hypothalamus, the pituitary, in their signaling of further downstream hormones. And then, so we have a fourth kind of hypothyroidism, which is the T4 to T3 conversion issue. And that can be either what they call a euthyroid, which is... Uh, uh, problems in the liver and the kidneys because those are the primary organ systems for thyroid conversion or we have a non non euthyroid and it's stress and activities of daily living and adrenal issue causing uh, a decrease in the amount of total T4 and free T4 being converted into T3. Then we have our neuroendocrine regulation, we have our sex hormones, total testosterone, free testosterone, sex hormone binding globulin, DHEA sulfate and estradiol. You know, one of the issues uh, with this is um, uh, a difficulty of working with our female patients because obviously uh, the estrogen level is going to fluctuate depending on the menstrual cycle. And so I, I work with just sort of a standard uh, range um, for a non-specific estradiol reading. And, you know, then you can work out if it's above that or below that. Um, and then you can start kind of tweaking the, the response based upon the information that you will have, but I don't necessarily have for um, levels for, you know, premenstrual, uh, during the menses, um, during ovulation and that type of thing. Cardiovascular system. We can really, really do a, a really good job with evaluating cardiovascular risk. It's one of my favorite panels to run, looking at, uh, gosh, 15, 16 independent clinical risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And it doesn't just happen, have to be the, the lipid panel. It goes way beyond that. We need a high-sensitivity C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, homocysteine, glucose, AST will be affected by the cardiovascular system, fasting insulin will be, testosterone levels play a huge impact on cardiovascular health, estradiol will play a big role, LDH, ferritin, vitamin D, hemoglobin A1C, and that type of thing. And then further down, we have inflammation and tissue damage, uh, LDH uh, above optimal and above the reference range, very indicative of tissue damage. Albumin, uh, again, low albumin can be reflective of uh, tissue damage and inflammation. C-reactive protein, obviously, is a marker for inflammation. An elevated ferritin level, um, you know, you've got to rule out whether or not that's, uh, you know, iron overload issues, but an elevated ferritin is a very strong indicator of inflammation. 
as is platelets and alkaline phosphatase and increased uric acid and the ESR and those types of things. Then we're looking at allergies. We're looking at basophils and uh, eosinophils as the uh, kind of main uh, elements to look at for allergies. And then we've got our acid-base balance. We're looking at CO2, anion gap, and chloride. Anion gap obviously is a calculated measurement of the difference between the anions and the cations in the body. And then finally, we're looking at the immune system. This is the ratios and, and looking at the, the, the percentages of total white blood cell counts that are composed of neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils, and looking at vitamin D and alkaline phosphatase, uh, giving us a really good overall picture of whether or not you know, we're dealing with immune issues. So what kind of immune issues are we looking at? Well, again, we're looking at immune insufficiency, so sort of a decreased level in total white blood cell counts. And then we're looking at, are we looking at a bacterial infection? Are we looking at a, at a, a viral infection? Are we looking at the, um, is it chronic or is it acute? Um, and that type of thing. So this is, uh, I think, an important lens to look at things through. It's served me very, very well. And my software is built on these principles as well. So those of you that want to use the software or are using the software, you'll recognize that a lot of my functional indices that I talk about are very uh, similar to these.